All right, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, let me just get my timer here. Uh, and thanks, Jacob, for uh, for organizing this really great series that was, um, that, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it during the pandemic, and it has looked really great afterwards, too. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about the Everett interpretation. Uh, I, called, I call this project Centering the Everett Interpretation. I'm going to be proposing a specific version of the Everett Interpretation, one that, you know, has a has a specific resolution of the probability problem. Um, okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> Let me just start by setting up in very broad brushstrokes what the what the puzzle is and how I'm going to propose. Uh, and, and then after setting up the puzzle, I'll sort of take you through the, the outline for what's what's going to come. Okay, so the puzzle is something like this. According to the Everett interpretation, uh, the evolution of the universe is deterministic. There's this thing, the wave function. Uh, there's this mathematical wave function that you know aptly represents physical reality. I'm going to just refer to the reality be as a wave function. Um, and the evolution of reality, of the physical wave function that reality is, is deterministic, uh, meaning something like you know the state of uh, reality at one time determines what the state is at other times. Uh, of course, it, this determination is happening in accord with um, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so that this is something that you know most most versions of the Everett interpretation have this have this in common. They most of them subscribe to some sort of deterministic evolution of uh, the reality's wave function. That's the first part. Uh, uh, the the first thing that will lead to the puzzle. The second thing that sort of has tension with that first thing is uh of course connected to the born rule the prop the issue uh, the 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 idea here is something like okay so re the evolution of the wave function is deterministic but there are phenomena that are indeterministic in reality in particular according to the born rule experimental outcomes are probabilistic there are you know given that the wave function is in a certain state there is a probability a non-zero non-one probability of the wave function uh you know the well the outcome of a particular sort of experiment uh, being thus and so. And so the puzzle that I'm going to be focusing on this in this talk is how do you reconcile this tension between, you know, one, the determinism of uh, Schrodinger evolution, and two, the indeterminism of the Born rule. <laughs> now, there are going to be, there are many other things to talk about in the Everett interpretation that I'm just not going to get into. I've talked uh, in some of my work. I've I've discussed typicality in the Everett interpretation. Um, there are there are problems that aren't that don't concern probability per se in Everett, but rather just concern like how you define you know three dimensional physical stuff out of out of the wave function that is reality. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that. I have projects actually getting into that, um, and I'd be happy to discuss it more in the Q and A later. But this is the puzzle, the kind of tension here that I'm going to be focusing on. Evolution of the universe is on the one hand deterministic, but on the other hand, uh, uh, the experimental outcomes that we use to actually test this theory are indeterministic. What to make of that? Okay, so here's a here's an outline of um, uh, uh, what's gonna what's to come, and I'm going to be pulling on a lot of different subfields of philosophy, and that's why this this uh, this particular project of mine is sort of in some ways one of the most involved because it, it's going to require metaphysics, it's going to require some normative theory, it's going to require, very importantly, a, a subtle but extremely important distinction between two kinds of propositions and two kinds of terms. So it's going to require some philosophy of language and linguistics. And then, of course, philosophy of physics is all is all throughout. So here's how I'm going to try to, uh, you know, step by step get into all that. I'll start by talking about the metaphysics of, of individual people and you know objects and that sort of thing those sorts of things uh the metaphysics of branches then i'm going to talk at length about this very important distinction between two kinds of propositions uncentered propositions and centered propositions uh roughly put they're going to correspond to a distinction between two kinds of uh terms that appear in all sorts of languages english and uh, all sorts of formal languages too uh a distinction between indexicals and like non-indexicals like names or definite descriptions. Okay, once I've done those two things, that metaphysics and that fill language, then I'm going to finally be able to present to you uh, my preferred interpretation of the Born rule, you know, given all this other Everettian stuff in the background. I'm going to call it the centered Born rule to avoid 
begging any questions and just give this specific way of thinking about the born rule and name. Um, and that's basically going to be the view. The, the, that's going to be where the tension gets resolved. It gets resolved in this, in this uh, principle I'm calling the centered born rule. Okay, after I do that, uh, I'm gonna, there's going to be a lot of follow-up stuff that I need to talk about. Um, the reason is uh, the way the center born rule is going to work is by, by way of a very strange posit. It's going to posit that these things called centered propositions, which as I'll explain later, are very subjective, um, have a certain kind of like really uh, uh, objective chance of obtaining. And there's, there's just kind of a prima facie confusion or puzzle or tension or something, how to make sense of these objective chances of these subjectively centered propositions. I call these chances centered chances, chances of centered propositions. So the next part of the talk is devoted to a particular analysis of what centered chances are. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give a, a, an analysis on a par with the kinds of analyses that philosophers have often given of what uh, a chance is, whereby chance they usually, if not almost exclusively, have meant chances of uncentered propositions. Okay. Then finally, I'm going to discuss three different upshots of the material that I'm presenting here. Uh, the first upshot is going to have to do with uh, kind of the nature of lawhood. Some laws are going to end up being branch relative in a really striking way. Uh, I'm going to explain why that's actually a great feature of the present version, the version of the Everett interpretation that I'm pitching to you today. Uh, that's the first upshot, the, the branch relativity of lawhood. The second upshot is going to be some comments on what I call rationality accounts of the Born Rule. So these are accounts that like, you know, people like David Wallace and others have, have defended um, where you think of the Born Rule uh, as uh, along the line, something like the following lines. It's telling you the ideally rational credences to have in certain sorts of propositions. Uh, I'm going to, because that's been talked about so much, I'm not going to retread old ground there to too great an extent, but I will talk a little bit about it because I think the centered Born Rule that I'm proposing uh, uh, kind of illuminates what uh, a nice way of improving on, you, you could basically uh, better understand the centered board rule by seeing how it compares to these rationality accounts. And then the last, the third and last upshot that I'll discuss is the whole talk here is going to have a really striking implication for an assumption I call the orthodox assumption that's just completely pervasive throughout philosophy and philosophy of physics and almost completely pervasive throughout physics. I mean, I, there are some physicists, as I'll discuss, like Hartle and Srednicki, who, who, who uh, have said some things that might be construed as challenging the orthodox assumption. But for the most part, this is a very standard assumption um, about the range and scope of what fundamental physics can explain. The centered Born rule is going to suggest that the range is bigger than you might have thought, basically. Uh, and then that'll be the talk. Okay, so let's start with, uh, yeah, some metaphysics. So the, the way to think about branches and people and objects um, that I'm going to use here uh, is called the worm view in some parts of the literature and other parts of the literature. It gets called the Luisian view. Here's the basic idea. So remember, we've got reality. So it's this wave function. Again, by that, I just mean this mathematical wave function is an apt that's calling reality wave function is just a shorthand for this a mathematical wave function that aptly describes what is reality. Uh, there's this wave function that divides fairly cleanly into branches. Um, these are something like, you know, approximately non interacting regions of the wave function that behave more or less like classical worlds. Okay, that's what branches are. People are four dimensional space time words worms, and there are parts of these branches. Um, so people are, so for example, me, uh, uh, you know, what Isaac would be on this picture, um, let's, let's, let's imagine that space-time was fundamentally four-dimensional just for this illustrative example, and then I'll say something about thinking about this in the context of the wave function being fundamental reality or near fundamental reality. What Isaac would be in a four-dimensional space-time would be something like all the matter points that you know are located at space-time points where I am, basically. So you know that 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 region like starts at the spatiotemporal location that is my birth, and it ends at the spatiotemporal location that is my death, and it's all and you know between those two locations, there's a bunch of other locations that my matter is at, uh, and that's what Isaac is. Isaac is that four-dimensional space-time worm. 
Now, of course, what on earth could it mean to say that Isaac is a four-dimensional space-time worm if reality is, you know, uh, a wave function um, in some sort of high-dimensional space? That's a really difficult question. I, like I say, I actually have a research project right now where I give an like, analysis of parthood uh, among wave functions that uh, recapitulates or actually implies a lot of classical uh, metaphysical Mariology. Um, but I'm not going to get into that now. I'm just going to set aside this problem of how to, you know, get ordinary objects out of the wave function. I'm just going to say, plug in whatever your favorite account is, if it's a Wallace type pattern account or if it's my like Mariology account or whatever. Um, Fans of Everett have to have some way of, you know, getting ordinary objects out of the wave function. And what I'm saying here is, uh, here's, once you have that way of getting the ordinary objects out, here's what they're going to be. They're going to be these four-dimensional uh, space-time worms. So let me give you a picture. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to spend some time on this slide because there are some somewhat subtle but very important details of uh, the sort of physical situation here. So we've got a wave function, uh, and it splits a few times. That's what these, uh, you know, dotted lines occasionally uh, separating from each other represent. And we've got four agents, uh, Susie 1, Susie 2, Susie 3, Susie 4, uh, one on each um, of four branches. The four branches, uh, each one starts at the bottom of the diagram, t equals 0, and goes to some point at the top of the diagram, t equals 3. So that's how the diagram is representing the fact that branches are temporally extended, okay? Um, you know, the, the, there is a branch from t equals zero to t equals three where the, the top point is at the upper left of the diagram. That's, that's one branch, branch one, say. Then there's another branch, t equals zero to t equals three, where the top point is the middle left uh, top point in the diagram, just below Susie two. That's branch two, say. And then there's branch three and branch four sort of symmetrically on the other side of the diagram. Each Susie is a part of their respective branch. So that 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 dotted line, uh, that 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 um that continuous curve uh, that I just called branch one contains Susie one. Susie one's in there. And Susie one, like branch one, is a temporally extended object. Okay. So Susie one exists at t equals zero, t equals one, t equals two, t equals three, and all the times in the interim. Okay, she is she is temporally extended along the branch to which she belongs. Same with Susie two. Susie two is also temporally extended along the branch to which she belongs. Same with Susie three. Same with Susie four. Okay, uh, super important thing. Each each of these objects, Susie one, Susie two, and Susie three, and Susie four, they are distinct. They are non-identical. Uh, super obvious, argue, easy argument to see why they have different properties. Here's a property that Susie 1 has that Susie uh, uh, 2 lacks. Susie 1 is completely contained in branch 1. Here's a property that Susie 2 has that Susie 1 lacks. Susie 2 is completely contained within branch 2. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know, if X and Y have different properties and X and it's not identical to Y, it follows that Susie 1 and Susie 2 are distinct objects. Um, that's just a kind of like overly complicated metaphysics philosophy way of saying, obviously, different objects are different. Uh, uh, now, there are similarities between each of these four agents. In fact, there are, there, are, there are periods of time where there are physical duplicates of one another. Uh, and that's really important to recognize as well. So from time t equals zero to time t equals one, all four Susies, and in fact, all four branches that the Susies are on, are physical duplicates of one another, okay? Doesn't mean that the branches are identical. Of course, the branches are different. Similarly, doesn't mean that the Susies are identical. Of course, this, each Susie, Susie 1 and Susie 2 are still distinct. It's just that they, they are physically identical in, in this particular part of their total extents, okay? They are physical duplicates is kind of a less confusing way to say it. Physical, physically identical makes it sound like they are, in fact, identical. But again, it's really important to see. They're just not, between t equals zero and t equals one, they're physical duplicates. The kind of like, you know, classic example to try to explain what's going on here is think, think of roads, okay? Think of two roads that overlap for a segment, but then diverge. Those two roads are still two. There's still two of them. They're distinct roads. One road goes north and one road goes south. So one road has the property of going north, which the other road lacks. The other road has the property of going south, which the first road lacks. So again, Leibniz's law, the two roads are distinct. Nevertheless, 
there are parts of the roads where they they overlap, or at least what's really important for present per, for the purposes of the present analogy, there are there are segments of the roads that are physical duplicates. For each road, there is a segment of that road that is a physical duplicate of a segment of the other road, namely the part where they are physically overlapping. In that part, they have exactly the same crack distribution, the same macadam pattern of you know cracks among the macadam and so on. Later on, they don't. Because later on, they don't have the same distributions of cracks, et cetera, they're distinct roads. Nevertheless, they are physical duplicates for a particular stretch of time. That's what's going on in this picture. Okay. So from time t equals zero to t equals one, that's the situation for the four different Susies. From at, at t equals one, a quantum event occurs. So the two Susies split into two groups of two. Um, Susie one and Susie two see the electron, let's say, you know, do one thing. Susie three and Susie four see the electron do something else. Um, uh, now Susie one and Susie two are physical duplicates, and Susie three and Susie four are physical duplicates. But Susie one is not a physical duplicate of Susie three. You know, all that sort of stuff. Then the branches split again. So now none of the Susies are, are physical duplicates. Okay, that's the underlying metaphysics. Now for language. So in the empirical science of linguistics, there is an extremely basic, elementary, important distinction between two kinds of terms. A distinction that is as important as the distinction in physics between like, you know, a scalar field and a, a scalar valued field and a vector valued field, or something like that. I mean, this, this is, a crucial distinction in philosophy of language. Uh, indexicals and non-indexicals. An indexical, let me just give you some examples of indexical so you can get a feel for it. Uh, the word I, the word it, the word now, the word here. Those are examples of indexicals. Examples of non-indexicals, the word Susie one, the word, uh, or the, the description, the definite description, Schrodinger's cat, uh, the name 125 PM, the name Boston. Those are non-indexicals. Um, there just isn't enough time for me to explain to you why uh, these, these terms sort of are grouped differently in linguistics. Roughly put, the reason is because these, these, uh, the indexicals make a certain kind of characteristic semantic contribution to the truth conditions of the sentences in which they appear. The non-indexicals, like names like Susie One and Boston, or definite descriptions like Schrodinger's cat, make a different kind of among themselves, systematically similar semantic contribution to the truth conditions of the sentences in which they appear. And that's why you get this. So for those who are interested, uh, uh, examples of indexicals tend to um, uh, involve two indices or more, uh, where the indices are typically taken to be possible worlds. Classic Kaplanian example, one world serves as a, a context of assessment, another world serves as a circumstance of evaluation. If that didn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. Um, um, uh, Non-index goals just take one possible world, the, the context of assessment. Um, okay. Uh, to get a feel for the distinction, it actually helps to talk more about the propositions that those two classes of sentences are used to express. Um, so uncentered propositions, very roughly put to a first approximation, are propositions that are expressed without index goals. So let me give you an example. Uh, take the English sentence, November 29, uh, 2022, say, if you want to be really specific, is Tuesday. That expresses an uncentered proposition. It uses a name or a definite description, November 29, 2022, uh, uh, to pick out a particular object, um, whatever it is that is this day, uh, and then attributes a property to that object via the predication is Tuesday, namely the property of being Tuesday. Centered propositions are propositions expressed with indexicals. So for example, take the English sentence, it is Tuesday. Okay, that's an English sentence. Uh, now it is true, it's a, it's a true English sentence. The proposition it expresses does indeed hold, but, and this is, this is both sort of the most important part of the talk and the hardest for people to understand uh, who don't do linguistics. So I'm really gonna, really gonna uh, emphasize this. The proposition expressed by it is Tuesday is distinct from the proposition expressed by November 29, 2022 is Tuesday, even when they're both said, you know, today. Okay. Many ways to see why these propositions are distinct. Let me give you another quick one. Um, one of them will be true tomorrow and the other will be false tomorrow. <laughs> Obviously, one and the same thing can't be both true and false at the same time. So, of course, these propositions have to be distinct. 
Uh, I'll just tell you the answer, which one's gonna be true tomorrow. Obviously the proposition expressed by November 29, 2022 is Tuesday. That's obviously still gonna be true tomorrow. The proposition expressed by it is Tuesday uh, will be false tomorrow because it'll be Wednesday tomorrow. Um, and there's tons of other arguments in the in the philosophic literature and linguistics literature for why these uh, for why these um, uh, two propositions are distinct that I'm not going to go into. Um, but yeah, they are indeed distinct and importantly so, and it's because of the way that index schools figure in the second proposition. Um, here's another example, but one that's more relevant and connected to the present talk. Uh, the proposition expressed by this English sentence, Susie one is on the leftmost branch is different from the proposition expressed by the following English sentence. I am on the leftmost branch, even when the latter is uttered by Susie one. Okay. Even when Susie one is the one saying both of these sentences, she is saying different things. Okay. That's, that's all the proposition is for my purposes here. It's just what's expressed by a sentence. You can even do the whole presentation with just sentences and no propositions. Actually, I just find the proposition talk a bit easier. Um, to comprehend. But these two sentences are expressing importantly numerically distinct propositions, and that's going to play a huge role in my resolution of the tension from before. Um, now, sometimes I get pushback on this, and I don't know how to, where people insist that the propositions expressed by these sentences are the same. I don't know how to, without being seeming rude, charitably respond to that pushback. Because it's challenging, you know, the most, one of the most successful empirical sciences that we have, the science of linguistics. It, that science, that, that posits this distinction. And there is, there is, you're just empirically wrong if you think that these two sentences express uh, the same proposition. Our, you know, our best empirical science of meaning and language says that the propositions expressed by these are distinct. Unless you want to redo all of linguistics, from at least from Kaplan forward, but maybe from you know Chomsky forward or something. At least you want to you know replace generative grammars and Kaplanian uh, you know two indices semantics with something else, which nobody is going to be in a position to do because that science has been so successful so far. Uh, you're going to have to accept that the propositions expressed by these two sentences are are distinct. Okay, so we've done some metaphysics, we've done some language. Now I'm going to present to you my interpretation of the centered born rule okay uh, of the born rule excuse me and i call it the centered born rule so the interpretation is this the centered born rule assigns the usual psi squared probabilities it assigns them though as chances to centered propositions which propositions well propositions of the following form i am on thus and so branch we are on thus and so branch propositions like I'm on a branch where the electron comes out X spin up, or we are on a branch where the electron comes out X spin down. Those are the propositions that are getting assigned, assigned uh, psi squared chances by the centered Born rule. So a little more precisely, here's what the rule says. Uh, let E be an experimenter. Let psi be a wave function before measurement. Um, let CH sub E psi be a chance function that's been relativized to agents and wave functions. The relativity of the wave functions is just the normal, you know, you're looking at the chance, you know, of what the next state is given the, the initial state. Um, the relativity to agents is a little bit harder to uh, explain quickly. It comes from the, basically the way that the logic of indexicals and propositions expressed using indexicals work. You have to relativize uh, chance functions to agents. And that's going to, or, or, or at least it doesn't have to be individual agents, but it has to be relativized to some sort of centers, as they're often called in, in linguistics, meaning the agents themselves or the community of agents, or even the a whole branch could serve as a center, you know, everybody who's on some particular branch. Um, but regardless, yeah, CHE psi is, is just this chance function. Uh, Ket A is just the col a collection of branches into which the wave function splits. Of course, as is typical for simplicity, I've been speaking as if the wave function is splitting into discrete count, you know, numbers of branches that you can count. Obviously, that's not what happens. Obviously, what's going on is there's like, you know, a branch density. Um, and I, yeah, I have a paper where I talk about the best way to understand that density is in terms of a typicality measure. Uh, so just think of cat A as like, you know, uh, telling you about some, some sort of, you know, density of branches. And then finally, and this is the crucial part of the 
centered Born rule, uh, the proposition O sub A is the proposition I am in one of the ket A branches, okay? I am in one of the branches that look like that, one of the ones where the electron comes out X spin up or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's work through an example. Here's the diagram from before. Um, so we've got the four agents. Um, the agents are uh, uh, physical duplicates, remember, from time t equals zero to t equals one. Uh, the left two agents, Susie one and Susie two, are physical duplicates between times one and two. And the right two agents are physical duplicates between times one and two. Uh, 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 but they're not physical duplicates of each other. Like Susie one is not a physical duplicate of Susie three. And then at time t equals two, when some more quantum events occur and more branch splitting happens, um, uh, it's now the agents are no longer physical duplicates of one another. Um, so you might ask yourself, you know, down at time t equals zero, uh, what is the probability that the proposition I am in the leftmost branch uh, is going to obtain? Or to kind of like uh, maybe put it a little bit more clearly for the present example, suppose you're Susie one, okay, sitting there at t equals zero. Uh, you know that there's a bunch of agents that are physical duplicates of you. You're sitting there wondering, like all your physical duplicates are, what's what's the chance that I'm in the leftmost branch? What's the chance that I'm going to end up being the space-time worm that's in the branch that stays to the left? Okay. Uh, now, are everything I just said there used an indexical? <laughs> Sometimes this goes too fast for people. The question that I asked was, What's the chance that I'm in the leftmost branch? I did not ask the question, what's the chance that Susie one is in the leftmost branch, even though in this scenario, I am Susie one. Definitely did not ask that question. It's absolutely crucial that you understand that the question I asked involves an indexical. What's the chance that I am in the leftmost branch? Okay. And according to the centered Born rule, that chance is just the usual sort of psi squared chance. The chance relative to Susie one given the initial wave function at time t equals zero of the centered proposition I'm in the leftmost branch is that, that squared thing. Okay, so that's how the centered Born rule works. How does this resolve the tension? Okay, how does this resolve the tension we began with? Maybe you can already see the, the idea, but it's actually, I think, an ex extremely nice, elegant resolution. Since the Everett interpretation implies that the universe is deterministic, uncentered propositions are always going to have chance one or chance zero, okay? So remember, I told you what SUSY1 was. I said SUSY1 is just defined as that four-dimensional space-time word on the leftmost branch. So now suppose I ask you, so what's the chance that SUSY1 is on the leftmost branch? Well, obviously the chance is one. <laughs> that, I mean, that she, she is a part of the leftmost branch, so with chance one, SUSY1 is on the leftmost branch. And Susie one knows this, of course, you know, she, she's got her little diagram in front of her. So at T equals zero, she's got her little diagram in front of her. She's saying, yeah, Susie one, obviously on the leftmost branch. Susie two is on the middle left. Susie three is on the middle right. Susie four is on the rightmost. And she's just wondering her, to herself though, she's asking herself the, again, indexical question, but which one am I? Am I on the leftmost branch? And that, that's the, that proposition, I'm on the leftmost branch. That's what's giving a non-unit non-null chance, chance one-fourth, let's say, if the if the relevant coefficients are all one over root two or something uh, for all the splits. So how does this resolve the tension? Well, yeah, the universe is definitely deterministic among the uncentered propositions. All the uncentered propositions always have chance zero or chance one. Susie one is on the leftmost branch, that is chance one. Susie one is on the rightmost branch, what's the chance of that? Zero, obviously, because she's not. Um, but so 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 we have total determinism among all the uncentered propositions, all the propositions you would express, you know, using names and predicates in the usual way. Among the centered propositions, however, we have rampant indeterminism. Uh, the centered proposition, I am on the leftmost branch, that is getting chance one fourth relative to Susie one, let's say, into the initial wave function. And again, that is getting chance one fourth even when Susie one is the one uttering it. Because again, the English sentence Susie one is on the leftmost branch expresses a proposition that is different from the proposition expressed by the English sentence, I'm on the leftmost branch, even when Susie one is the person who's uttering both sentences. So 
where does attention go? You got determinism among the uncentered propositions and indeterminism that follows the sort of vulnerable probabilities among the centered propositions. And that's the view. Okay, so let's quickly check. Great. Half hour in. Um, just to like, because I know it's a you know, this stuff is a lot to take in, and I always do enjoy having extra time to talk. I'm shooting to be a little bit under an hour. Um, uh, so I think we're 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 on track to do that. Now, what I'm gonna do, so I've resolved for you the tension, I've given you the centered born rule. Center born rule assigns objective chances to these centered propositions, like I am on the leftmost branch, propositions like that. This raises a ton of interesting questions and issues. And it is the pursuit of these questions and issues that forms one part of uh, uh, one of my research programs. Perhaps the most like central issue is the following. What on what the hell is a centered chance? <laughs> okay. We're kind of familiar with uncentered chances. The 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 uncentered proposition, you know, the radium atom uh decays, will decay, something like that. That uncentered proposition, we, we kind of have a feel for what it means to assign a chance to a proposition like that. Now, of course, as philosophers often argue about it, that's still a very kind of difficult question. What does it mean to assign a chance to a proposition like that? But the literature is kind of, you know, the literature and philosophy of probabilities is filled with with answers to that question and proposed answers to that question. Um but remember, chances are these objective things. Um, you know, th there's this important distinction. I don't think I need to go over it for this crowd, but there's this important distinction between chance and credence, just really quick. Chances are kind of supposed to be objective in the world probabilities. You know, if the chance of something is a certain way, it doesn't really depend on that person's mental states. Um, credences are in your head. They're they're kind of like a degreed analog of belief. So they're these subjective mental state sorts of things. Um, it kind of makes sense to, to talk about the credences of certain central propositions, at least on the face of it. You can kind of see how that would go because credences are fairly subjective central propositions, propositions about I or here or now. Those obviously have a very subjective character to them. Makes sense to talk about uh, uh, credences of central propositions, and people have. What on earth would it mean to say that a centered proposition, this kind of subjective thing, has an objective worldly chance of obtaining? Or as I put it, what are centered chances? I think this is a super interesting question. I think this question has actually come up in philosophy, but I don't know exactly what to say about the lack of discussion of it. Uh, I think maybe at least some people don't really, who even who talk about these things that I'm calling centered chances, don't really realize how, how bizarre it would be. Um, you know, there's, there are papers by Lewis and Elga. Uh, I mean, fantastic papers, obviously, like amazing papers on the sleeping beauty problem um, where they kind of go back and forth. So yeah, this is not supposed to be a criticism of those two great philosophers, uh, but they do go back and forth between talking about chances uh, of propositions where the algebra propositions they're talking about has to include centered propositions because of the setup of the case. And they don't really seem to like recognize that, or at least they don't get into that fact. And then when I've at least talked to, to Adam Elga about these things, um, yeah, the like the kind of radicalness of what that would mean, uh, uh, it just didn't, didn't get picked up in the philosophy literature. I want to pick it up. I think this is a really interesting question. Um, just to give you some other citations for people where I think a version of this question comes up, but it doesn't really get uh, answers and analyses don't get given. Uh, uh, Al Wilson has a really interesting uh, book on you know how to understand a ton of stuff like modality propositions in in Everettian terms. Um, he too sometimes seems to be talking about what I'm talking about by centered chance. Uh, he doesn't really give an analysis of centered chance. I mean, he doesn't. Um, uh, he kind of gives a kind of overview functional characterization, but I think it would be really helpful for his project to have an analysis. So I'm hoping, and I, I've gotten conf confirmation from him, <laughs> he could take this analysis and sort of plug it into his account and sort of like, you know, shore up that part of the account. Um, Michael Kay has also talked about this stuff a little bit. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is um, um, get into uh, one particular analysis of centered chance. It's based on the best system analysis uh, uh, because I really like that account of laws. Uh, I've proposed versions of the best system analysis. I saw Barry's here. Um, and of course, Barry, I owe you a best system analysis of centered chance. I'm going to talk about centered chance as my, as my former advisor. Um, so that's that's how I'm going to analyze them. 
But I also want to flag that I think there could be interesting analyses uh, in terms of like that are more like primitivist, like a Tim Maudlin style analysis of center chance is certainly available, uh, a propensity style analysis, uh, an actual frequentist style analysis. It's a really interesting question whether those analyses of center chance would be better or worse than their counterpart analyses of uncentered chance. Just not going to get into it here. Let's get into the analysis uh, of centered chance that I want to talk about. Okay. So I'm going to have to start by reviewing the best system analysis of laws. According to that analysis, uh, laws are theorems of those deductive systems that best balance a bunch of theoretical virtues. Sort of standard ones would be like being simple, uh, being strong, fitting the frequencies really well, like the, the posited probabilities of those deductive systems fit the, the, re the relevant frequencies. Um, like I say, I, I've done some work on this where I've tried to argue that another important theoretical virtue is what I call calculational tractability. So the laws have to support tractable calculations. Of course, the laws don't have to be tractable, like the Navier-Stokes equations are not all that tractable. Uh, but the Navier-Stokes equations too, do support tractable calculations in the sense that they support certain sorts of you know, numerical estimations and infinite series expansions and stuff like that. Um, and I think that that's constitutive of what it is to be a law. To be a law is in part to, to support calculation in that way. Um, but you don't have to subscribe to that view. Any best system analysis of laws, like Mike Hicks has one, uh, a nice one, Chris Dorse has a nice one, would, would do here. Um, what underlies the idea of the best system analysis is something like this. To be a law is to be part of the best overall summary of the world. What is a best overall summary? Well, it's a best balance of all these things that you'd want your summary to be like, mainly super simple, super strong, like telling you a lot about the world fitting the frequencies super well, being very sort of tractable and understandable. Um, and that's what it is to be a law, according to the best system analysis. So as people like Barry Lower have discussed, um, this analysis lends itself exceptionally well to an elegant analysis of chance. Here's the idea, uh, the best system analysis of uncentered chance. Well, I'm, and I'm calling it uncentered chance. Of course, it wasn't called that in the literature because this, this distinction between these two kinds of chances wasn't really... Uh, on people's radars. Um, so an uncentered chance, according to this analysis, is the following. It is a proposition which, one, assigns a probability to an uncentered proposition, okay, and two, follows from the best deductive systems. So in other words, you know, you've got your deductive systems, which are best. Let's say there's just one for simplicity, uh, for, for the sake of the example. What is it for some fact to be a chance fact? Uh, well, it's for that fact to do two things. One, the fact takes some uncentered proposition and assigns a probability to it. You know, it's, it takes the proposition, the coin will land heads, and it assigns a probability of one half to that proposition. And two, that whole proposition, the one assigning a probability to an uncentered proposition, is an implication of that best deductive system. Okay. So, you know, the proposition, uh, the coin will la lands heads with probability one half. That follows from the best deductive system, the system which best balances all these theoretical virtues. Okay, what's the idea underlying this analysis of uncentered chance? The idea is this, uncentered chances are also helping us with our summaries of uncentered frequency facts. So like, how frequently does Susie 1 find herself on the leftmost branch? Or how frequently does Susie 2, the one that's for part of her temporal extent on the leftmost branch, but for part of her temporal extent is not. How frequently does Susie too find herself on the leftmost branch? Um, when she checks, meaning when she does an experiment of the form, like does the electron come out, you know, X spin up or X spin down or whatever it is. Uh, those are the kinds of frequency facts that uncentered chances help us summarize. How, you know, you've got some actual frequency with which coins land heads. Um, why is it, what, what does it mean, or, you know, to say that the chance of the coin, a coin landing heads is a half? It's to say, look, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to literally tell you how every single flip goes. That would be, it would be a very strong <laughs> description because it would actually tell you all the information about the flips, but it would be extremely complicated and ugly. It's not a good balance of simplicity and strength. Here's a better balance. I'm going to tell you about 50% of the time the coin lands heads. Um, that's a much better balance of being simple, but still being quite informative about the actual uh, ways that the coin flip goes, the coin flips go. Uh, that's an actually good summary of the coin flips. 
Okay, so with all that as background, here's the best system analysis of center chance, very, very similar to what I was just saying. A center chance is now going to be a proposition which one, assigns a probability to a centered proposition, and two, follows from the best deductive systems. Okay, exactly the same as for uncentered chance, it's just now the probabilities are allowed to be assigned to centered propositions as well as uncentered ones. How does this relate to like summarize, you know, summarize, summaries of stuff? Well, centered chances are also helping us summarize certain frequency facts. It's just the frequency facts in question are facts about centered propositions. How frequently do I find myself, note the use of the two indexicals, on the leftmost branch? You know, imagine Susie one or Susie two or whoever asking, asking themselves that. Um, those are the kinds of frequency facts that centered chances help us summarize. OK, so just as uncentered chances help us summarize facts about like how frequently does Susie one or Susie two find herself specifically on the leftmost branch. Uh, centered chances help us summarize centered frequency facts, such as facts about the rates at which uh, now I'm speaking as either Susie one or Susie two. I find myself on the leftmost branch. And that's what a centered chance is. So to step back and kind of summarize this analysis, uncentered chance and centered chance. Here's what they're doing for us. Here's where they come from. Both sorts of chances help us navigate the world. Uncentered chances help us summarize facts about what happens to Susie 1, to Isaac, and so on, where, where the use of the names there, Susie sub 1, Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, the use of the, those names is crucially important to what I'm saying in that sentence. Okay, Because centered chances help us summarize uh, facts about what happens to us or to me or to my community, or, you know, again, facts that are expressed via this, these kinds of indexical expressions. Um, and of course, both, we're going to need both summaries, because both sorts of facts are relevant to just life and science. Like, yeah, we need to know, um, you know, we need to know things like how often does uh, uh, CERN detect a certain, uh, a certain kind of um, uh, outcome of a certain sort of collision. But we also need to know how frequently does, and now I'm speaking as one of the people at CERN, this machine or our device over here uh, detect a certain kind of outcome frequency of, of collision. Uh, now, of course, you're probably thinking, yeah, oh, but those, those two things always go together. <laughs> like, of course, all, all, the frequency facts about how often CERN uh, detects a certain sort of collision are go, go with the frequency facts about how often, and again, now speaking as someone at CERN, I detect a certain sort of collision or my machine detects a certain sort of collision. Uh, to that, I respond, yeah, you're right. They do often go together, but occasionally they don't. One of the places where they don't is in this kind of the quantum weirdness of, this, of the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. I actually think another place where they don't is in cosmology. And I'm working on a paper called Centering Cosmology, where I use this stuff to develop, again, I think I already mentioned Hartle and Shrednicki, but use this stuff to develop a kind of view of the probabilities that they that they talk about um, in one of their physical review papers or a couple of their physical review papers. Um, but anyway, yeah, a K, most of the time in science, you know, the, the uncentered frequency facts and the centered frequency facts match, exactly. But sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it can be super important uh, to understanding what the empirical data is. Okay. <clears throat> So I presented my, my version of Everett, uh, the centered Born rule. I've it posited these things, centered chances. I've given you an analysis of what a centered chance is. The analysis clearly demonstrates how a centered chance can be objective. It's just a, it's a logical implication of the best summary of a bunch of facts. But the analysis also clearly makes room for the sort of subjective character of centered propositions. The facts that are being summarized are these subjective -y facts. So of course, uh, uh, there would be this subjective character to a, to a chance that is centered. Um, okay, so last part of the talk, uh, try to do this in, let's see, I've got about 15 minutes, but I'll try to do this in 10. Um, I'm going to just talk about some interesting implications of the, of the stuff from before. Uh, three interesting implications in particular. Here's the first one. Given this particular analysis of centered chances, the Born rule is not going to hold on all branches of the wave function. Definitely not. Why not? 
Well, because remember, the analysis says centered chances help summarize the frequencies with which certain things occur, like certain experimental outcomes, the frequencies with which centered, the centered frequencies with which uh, those, those outcomes occur. And those outcomes only occur uh, with, you know, roughly psi squared uh, frequencies on some branches. There are other branches where there would be a much better summary of the second centered frequency facts available. So the Born rule is only going to hold on branches where the centered frequency facts roughly conform to the psi squared measure. On branches like actually Susie ones in particular, remember she was on this leftmost branch, the Born rule is not going to hold because she's always seeing the electron you know, let's say the experiments in question are we've got these Z spin up electrons and we're seeing if they come out X spin up. She's always seeing them come out X spin up. So what's the best summary of the frequency with which the center proposition I see the electron come out X spin up obtains on Susie one's branch? It obtains 100% of the time because that's what she always sees. That's going to be the best summary. So that's going to be the center chance that the best uh, system is going to imply. And so that's going to be the center chance fact for her branch. And so the laws on her branch, there are, there are going to be laws that are branch relative. There will be the Born rule holding on branches like ours, but other rules holding on branches like Susie wants. Now, this is, I think, a fantastic feature of the view that I've just proposed to you. Because the Born rule is obviously a terrible summary of what's going on on other branches. On those other branches, you know, and there's many ways to see why it doesn't match the frequency facts at all. Um, the Born rule chances, if you took them to be chances, would be terrible guides to the rational credences to have on those other branches. On Susie One's branch, it's obviously uh, rational to not set your, uh, you know, your your degrees of confidence, your credences in various uh, outcomes equal to the Born rule probabilities of those outcomes because the Born rule probabilities just don't match frequencies, and this branch relativity of some laws, not all laws, the Schrodinger equation doesn't vary from branch to branch. It, it just holds in, in reality. Uh, but the branch relativity of some laws like the center born rule is a really good feature of the analysis that I've proposed. Second upshot, which is related to the first, um, this is an advantage that the uh, my interpretation of the born rule has over rationality accounts of the born rule in Everett. So, you know, there's lots of different rationality accounts. I obviously can't speak to them all here. Let me give you a quick summary of um, uh, um, roughly what they say. <laughs> they say something like this. Uh, take an agent on a branch. Um, the agent's credences in certain experimental, certain experimental outcomes have to equal the Born rule probabilities of those outcomes. Um, and that's just true across reality. So across all the agents on all the branches. So in particular, take an agent on a branch where Z spin up electrons are always found to have X spin up, like Su let's say that's Susie one. Um, then according to rationality accounts, because the Born rule says the rational credence to half in the Z spin up electron being found to have X spin up is a half, that agent, Susie one, is rationally required to have credence one half in the next electron she sees having X spin up. But that is just that is just an utterly implausible normative principle. Given what Susie One has, see, has seen, it is rationally permissible. It is definitely not required. <laughs> it is rationally permissible for her to have a higher credence than a, a credence that's higher than a half in the next electron, you know, next C-spin up electron being found to have X spin up. It's at least rationally permissible for her to believe that. And rationality accounts of the Born rule are committed to denying that, that claim because they're committed to saying, no, she's rationally required to have credence one half, because that's what the Born rule says. Now, fans of rationality accounts of the Born rule have, have responses to this. And I was actually hoping we could talk about this in the Q&A because um, I find the response extremely odd uh, uh, and would love to have it like sustained back and forth about what it's claiming. But here, here's basically what the response is. The response goes, one standard response, of course, there are many others. I'm just going to talk about one here. Uh, goes something like this. Look, you Isaac, you misconstrued rationality accounts. They don't just you know, imply that uh, uh, Susie one is rationally required to have credence a half in the, you know, to have unconditional credence a half in the proposition the next Z spin up electron will be found to have X spin up. No, rationality accounts only imply that Susie is rationally required to have conditional credence one half in that proposition where your conditional eye, where you're conditioning on 
uh, the truth of the uncentered Born rule. So in other words, here's how to understand what the Born rule is saying. It's saying, given the you know conditional on the Born rule being true, a little more precisely, the rational conditional credence to have, conditional on the truth of this rule uh, in the Z spin up electron will be found to have X spin up is a half. So rationality, rationality accounts don't have any implications for the unconditional credences which agents should have. Uh, and in particular, they don't have the sort of implication I was just describing. Two problems with this response. First, um, suppose that this response grants what I was claiming earlier, uh, that it's, you know, it's rationally permissible for an agent to assign credence one, an agent like Susie to assign credence one to a proposition like all Z spin up electrons will be found to have an X spin up or the next Z spin up electron will be found to have X spin up. So as long as this conditional response grants that, this is a simple little mathematical proof shows the conditional response is committed to the following. Uh, such an agent who has credence one in that proposition has to assign credence zero to the uncentered Born rule. So this response, uh, and that's just because of stuff about conditional probabilities and so on. Uh, uh, so this response implies that certain agents are rationally required to have false beliefs, uh, which is which is a which is a cost of this kind of response. I mean, it would be nice. I mean, now it's true that uh, this, this situation has happened before in formal epistemology. Many principles, or many, occasionally a principle will imply that certain agents are rationally required to believe falsely, but it's always a cost of a principle when it does that. Um, I mean, another cost I didn't even put on here is because the agents have to assign credence zero to the uncentered Born rule in order to be rational. You know, you can't have the usual conditional probability definition uh, that, you know, we often have in mathematics where probability of A given B is probability of A and, a and B over probability of B. Uh, so you have to take conditional probabilities as sort of your basic probability units and define unconditional probabilities out of them. And then there's some issues about that that Blake von Frossen and Kenny S. Warren have gotten into. Um, so there's that problem too. But here's, a, here's another problem that I think is just part of why I find this response so bizarre. Uh, and uh, part of why, uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange response to me. Um, in a sense, it is completely trivial to claim, as this response does, that an agent's credences should conform to the uncentered Born rule, conditional on the truth of the uncentered Born rule. Like, uh, of course, if you're conditionalizing just on the proposition, you should, your credences should match the Born rule's probabilities, then it, 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 you know, sort of by the logic of many models of uh, ha having higher order evidence. So, you know, probably having credences about what your credences should be basically just by the mere model theory, uh, the logic of those, of, of, of those uh, uh, sorts of principles, that's going to follow. I mean, it's also going to follow <laughs> that conditional on the, uh, uh, a different sort of principle for setting your credences you should obey that other principle. Um, so take, take, take like, like, like the, the psi cubed measure, not the psi squared measure of the Born rule, but the psi cubed measure, call that the, the non-Born rule. It's also true uh, that agents should conform, uh, agents' credences should conform to the non-Born rules psi cubed measure conditional on the truth of the non-Born rules psi cubed measure. So something about this response is just like kind of uninformative. It, it's sort of, it's tautologically weird. Um, it, it, and this is where I like, I really would like to press on this a bit more and talk a bit more in Q&A because I, I, I don't have a grip on what's compelling about this response yet. Okay, last and I hope most interesting uh, of the three upshots. Okay, there is this assumption that's pervasive in philosophy of physics. To explain it, I have to, I have to reset your, your view. Uh, as philosophers of physics, often our view is just on explaining a certain range of phenomena. I want to reset your view to explaining absolutely everything. We're not just trying to explain why electrons do certain things. We're also trying to explain uh, why people have certain beliefs. We're also trying to explain why rabbits and wolves obey, you know, their dynamics obey roughly the lotka volterra equations. We're also trying to explain why, uh, you know, certain sorts of interventions on the economy will or will not lead to a recession. We're also, you know, we're, we're, we're femini feminist theorists. We're trying to explain patterns of privilege and oppression. Just absolutely everything in the world. That's the explanatory target for now, okay? Basic assumption that a lot of people make. To explain all that and our experience of all that, all we need from fundamental physics 
is a complete account of certain uncentered facts. So look, like you're trying to explain rabbits and wolves. Obviously, you're going to use stuff that's not from fundamental physics. You're going to use principles of biology. You're trying to explain uh, patterns of privilege and oppression. You're going to use, uh, uh, you know, uh, some some principles and some ideas from feminist theory. That's not fundamental physics. So your your complete explanation of everything is going to include tons of stuff that isn't just physics stuff. But what physics needs to contribute to that complete explanation, you know, there's still this question, okay, what's physics going to contribute? Assumption says what physics is going to contribute is just a complete account of certain uncentered facts, you know, namely uncentered facts about quantum fields or particles or whatever the, the like sort of fundamental level of reality is going to turn out to be. The centered born rule challenges this assumption because the centered born rule says no. The centered born rule is actually going to explain a bunch of centered facts as well, like facts about what I experience. So physics will explain facts about like what happens on branch one and branch two. Uh, fundamental physics will explain those sorts of uncentered facts. Yes, but fundamental physics via the centered born rule will also explain what happens on my branch. So we're going to get the more explanation on the fundamental physics than we might have thought. Maybe it's helpful to very quickly make a comparison to debates over temporal asymmetry. According to one view, uh, temporal asymmetric, asymmetric phenomena at higher levels are explained by, you know, one, fundamental dynamical laws that are symmetric temporally, and then two, other principles, you know, whatever they are, past hypothesis, whatever, that recover that temporal asymmetry at higher levels. Second view says, no, temporally asymmetric phenomena at higher levels can only be explained by fundamental laws that are temporally asymmetric themselves. I'm kind of saying the, a, an analogous thing with the centered approach to the Born rule. So the orthodox assumption says, look, centered phenomena at higher levels, what happens on my branch, uh, what happens to me, are only ever can, can all be explained by one, fundamental dynamical laws which describe uncentered facts only, and two, other principles which recover you know, center phenomena at higher levels. Centered Born rule says, no, fundamental physics, the explanatory purview of fundamental physics is greater than that. Some fundamental phenomena at higher levels can only be explained by fundamental laws that themselves describe centered facts via the centered Born rule. Okay, so conclusion. I've given you a metaphysical view. Branches are four-dimensional as are people and agents and communities and stuff like that. I talked a bit about, or a lot about, uh, the distinction between centered and uncentered propositions, and I used that to formulate the centered Born rule. The Born rule assigns chances to centered propositions. That resolves the probabilistic tension in Everett because, uh, uh, you know, the Schrodinger equation is completely deterministic over centered prop uh, over uncentered propositions. So those always obtain with chance either zero or one. What what obtains with non-unit, non-null chances are centered propositions, like I am on the leftmost branch. Then I proposed a best system analysis of what centered chances are. Uh, they're summaries of centered frequency facts. And I talked about some implications, like lawhood is branch relative. And uh, some, there are some problems for rationality accounts. And this orthodox assumption uh, might be worth questioning. All right, thanks very much. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have a lot of hands. I myself have many questions. I'm not sure if we'll have time to, to ask all of them. Uh, so uh, Matt actually had a question during the, the talk, and I want to make sure we get to Matt first. So Matt, please go ahead. Hi, yeah. OK, so I was trying to just raise a quick technical question, but I do want to expand on it a little bit if I can. Um, so when you were explaining the, um, the, the metaphysical biology of people, branching people, it was sometimes unclear to me whether you were saying that these that these individual uh, four dimensional people share time uh, temporal parts, or whether they only have qualitatively identical temporal parts. Uh, for example, between t equals one and t equals two. And I think what you're saying is that they actually share temporal parts, but they're nonetheless distinct people. Is that correct? I might have said that, but I shouldn't have. Um, I, I'm I'm neutral on that. So okay. uh, uh, the only change I would make is I would say uh, all I need for my purposes is that they have parts that are physically, not necessarily qualitatively, because you could think there's a qualitative you know, difference or something, but physically identical between t equals one and t equals two. Right. OK. OK, good. So that's why it wasn't clear to me, because you were actually trying not to take a stance on that. OK, good. So and, and the reason why I think that's in, an interesting question here is because um, 
you know, there, the idea that, that um, people can share temporal parts and ask questions about what's the chance that I will observe such and such an outcome. And there's an objection, I think, to this kind of Lewisian style of personal identity where it just seems weird for Susie to be four different people asking the same question at once or actually asking four different questions with the same words. And it makes the number of people present depend on what happens in the future and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then, and now I, I wanna mention another uh, sort of qualm I have about your view and, and, and then bring this back to the, this differentiation at a time issue. Um, so the other qualm is I feel like your, um, your best systems analysis of, of, of centered chances, if I understand it, it makes the it makes the laws depend on the facts on a branch, and one thing I would like uh, an account of uh, or a resolution of the probability problem for quantum mechanics to do is to explain to me why it is that um, in our branch in our history of quantum experiments, our outcomes conform so well to the Born rule. So I want to to explain the outcomes on our branch, and the the best systems account rather has the laws being explained by the outcomes. So, so and the reason why I think this comes can be brought back to the way we differentiate people at a time when they're branching is that if we had a view in which there exist uh, bundles of uh, physically identical people, but which are in fact distinct at a time and um, uh, and, and then take different paths in the future, then one can ask, well, then Susie, all of the Susies at once can ask in their separate you know, parallel worlds, uh, what's the chance that I'm going to observe such and such outcome? And they're asking about themselves and each one is only asking one question. Um, and also we could then attribute the chances to something more like the objective chance of a die outcome where it's just you know all of these branches have the same chance of going one way or another um and it's um and it's a, a, a physical matter due to the first physical circumstances and something more like the way that the outcomes of the die roll are and also then uh, you know, we could even just view those as non-centered chances rather than centered chances for those who have qualms about them. Good. So yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, there was a lot there, so I, I'll I'll cover the things that I remember, but I'm I'm not going to cover everything. So uh, if we have time, I, though, let you know, cut back in and um, ask it ask for the stuff I don't I don't cover. So just one one quick sort of thing that's actually it, it sounds pedantic and dumb, but it's going to be really important. You kept saying the Susies, and uh, I so on my picture that is the wrong way to describe the situation. I I would go back and describe it as I would say to you which Susie, uh, and then you would say something like Susie one, and then I would say yeah so uh, you know Susie one exists between t equals zero and t equals one, and so does Susie two and Susie three and Susie four, but they they aren't identical at that time. They just have parts at that time. That's it's kind of like you know the roads aren't aren't identical. Uh, I mean, you know the the English word identical at and then fill in the blank identical at a time identical at a location. It's kind of like polysemous. You could mean a few different things. Here's one thing you could mean by identical at a location. You just mean they really are like uh, you you could mean just they're physically the same. And that's what I mean when I talk about Susie one and two and three and four being identical at, at a time. Uh, that's all I mean by that. Now you could you could mean something really sort of stronger logically, like it's the same person, and that's just false on my picture because there are the four of them. So th this and this kind of response is I think how the literature often goes when people you know criticize Lewis's view of people by saying it's going to depend on what the future, you know, is going to happen in the future. And then the Lewis person says, I mean, I'm working in a four block picture, like uh, a, a 40 picture or something like that. So that that's all the stuff is already there. So that, you know, that's, there's no dependence involved here. It's just way, just different ways of picking out different sets of points or something like that. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and then there was something about, yeah, explaining the patterns, like why we see something. 
Um, yeah, so I feel like that is, I couldn't tell the extent to which that was the same type of criticism that often gets leveled against best system accounts. Uh, if, yeah, so uh, assuming that it is, I would just respond in the sort of many of the sort of standard ways that those people do. Uh, I was trying to think what could be different in this situation. And I wasn't, yeah, I'm actually not totally sure. I mean, I feel like it was good that you asked your question using index schools. You were like, what, why does this happen on our branch? Um, Cause that is the way to put it. That's gonna be a kind of physically fundamental fact of the universe. By physically fundamental, what I mean there is the sort of fact that figures in the like kind of bottom most physical laws because it's figuring in the centered born rule. I mean, I think fundamental physical facts can be explained. Um, you know, why do electrons have negative charge? Uh, uh, supposing that was a fundamental physical fact of the universe. I think there will be an explanation of that, but it'll be very, it won't be the sort of thing that like comes from physics. It'll be, there'll be like, uh, it'll be a mix of like metaphysics and logic. It'll, it'll have to do with like the essence of electron hood or something like that. And, and that's going to be how these explanations will go. So you won't get an explanation of why, uh, you know, just as you can't expect physics to, to explain like, you know, why, why do strings, I don't know, why are strings one dimensional or something? You can't expect physics to explain these because the, these facts will be sort of from the point of view of physical theory on a par. Um, and that's part of what's so weird about my proposal is it, it is saying that like these very subjective facts about like you uh, and me and us are are physically on a par with these you know facts about vibrations or charge or whatever uh i know there's a lot more there. i have a quick finger on that question if okay. it's okay yeah yeah um so i think one way that this differs from the usual criticisms of best systems yeah. analysis so in a best systems analysis at least in the most pedestrian flat-footed versions there's one and i'm i'm, I'm going here with like a very simple-minded pre-quantum picture, but there's there's one world, there's one history. And, you know, of course, it, there's, there's phenomena that happened in that history, there's patterns, and of course, we look for best systems analysis summaries of those patterns, and we, we turn those into our descriptions and our laws. And, you know, of course, a criticism people ask is, well, if there are no fundamental laws, how do you explain the patterns? And of course, what what a person would just say in response is, well, but then now you have to explain the laws, right? You're, I mean, something has to be explained. I think in this case, the extra feature is that there's something layered on top. There's not just one classical world anymore, right? You have all these different branches, you have all these different observers, and some of them have pasts that look very different from the Born rule, and some of them have pasts that look like the Born rule. Yeah. Uh, and so we have something over and above that now needs to be explained, which is why are we on a branch whose past looks like the Born rule and not on a branch that doesn't look like the Born rule. This is more than just there's a, a fixed set of facts. Now it, it it seems like which facts you have now depends on this indexical question of which branch I'm on. And it seems difficult to use the Born rule to assign probabilities when the Born rule is itself branch dependent, right? So, um, you know, you talked about how some branches on some branches, the best systems analysis is one given by the Born rule, the center of Born rule, and, and other branches, it's not. Well, but then how can I talk probabilistically what branch I'm on if the only tools I have to use it are branch dependent? It seems circular and anthropic. It's like the explanation for why I'm on a branch whose past looks good Born rule is if it weren't, then I wouldn't you be using the Born rule, but that's not really, it seems circular and, and anthropic and not in a helpful way. Does that, Matt, does that get sort of what you're trying to get at? Am I, am I? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I think we're thinking very much along the same lines. And I would also just add that, that um, you're giving us this picture of how things are on different branches and telling us that some branches aren't like this one, which it all follows from Everetti and quantum mechanics. But why should we believe anything about other branches if the if all we have are these fundamental facts about our own branch? Why should that tell us anything about other branches existing at all? Um, yeah, I don't I don't follow a lot of this. So number one, we don't have only fundamental facts about our own branch. Uh, number two, we have just you know all the normal facts. Uh, it's not it's like everything. It, 
all the branches exist in reality. So the questions you're raising are kind of like if you were like, explain why I'm here rather rather than there. And I'd be like, okay, like, I mean, I could appeal to some stuff about what the location here is like. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's a perfectly good explanation. And I'm going to say the exact same thing for the branches. Like, why am I why am I on this branch rather than that branch? I'll say, oh, well, this this kind of branch, you know, maybe you mean by that, why can life exist on this branch? Like, that's why we're here uh, rather than there on this branch where there are no agents. Um, you know, the the why are we here rather than there question in the in a sort of classical world, why are we here rather than say there is like over near Pluto, like, oh, well, because there's this Goldilocks zone and that's like nice and, you know, supports physical structures like this one. Um, but yeah, I just feel like all this is going to be perfectly, I, I don't see any mystery here to explaining an indexical fact, like why are we here rather than there? Um, I also don't, there was some claim about like, we can't talk about other branches, but that just seems empirically false to me. I just did. Uh, and you just did. We, we've been talking about other branches we could talk about branches where the electrons come out X spin up uh, two thirds of the time or one quarter of the time, or it's very easy to talk about all the I'm branches. Not can't, I'm not sure we can't talk about other branches. What I was trying to suggest is that, is that our evidence from quantum mechanics comes from the fact that our observations conform to the Born rule. And if that's just a best system for this particular branch, then it doesn't give us good reason to believe in other branches or to believe of that other branches have made the same yeah, well, Why are you saying that? I mean, the, the other branches fall out of decoherent patterns in the, the wave function that our evidence, so our evidence gives us reason to posit a wave function. We have maybe, let's say, separate reasons for preferring Everett over Bohm or something. Um, uh, we, we know the mathematics of decoherence, so we know there are these, these lumps. We, we kind of know, you know that these lumps are approximately classical. We could talk about all that. We've got good evidence for that. It's just the normal evidence. Um, well, and then I, our evidence just says there are agents that are going to have different experiences from us. But I don't see how that does anything like, is anything like circular or undermining, like, you know, we could get evidence on Earth that like, agent, you know, agents on Pluto are going to have very different experiences from us. But that doesn't like, that's not circular. That doesn't undermine anything just because they're over there rather than here. I mean, I feel like there's a tension with the branch relativity of of center chances, but I, I can't make it. I can't make it. Uh, if if I can it make it, maybe just quickly, super quickly, follow up on this. Um, so, of course, if you were to, to ask why are we here on Earth rather than floating in outer space or on Pluto, a, a good answer would be that outer space doesn't support, according to the physics science that we know, doesn't support life. The problem with the branches where the Born rule is violated is there are many branches where the Born rule is routinely violated, where there are sentient organisms who are just sure, few, yeah. who have a weird set of different uh, different laws. So we can't appeal to the usual anthropic. So usually the way the anthropic principle works is the answer to the question of why we're on planet Earth on a habitable planet Goldilocks and not somewhere else is because this is the only place there could be observers who could ask that question. The problem is this doesn't seem to apply in this case. In this case, there are all these branches with wildly born rule violating histories where there are organisms who are doing science and they're just using some weird other version other than the born rule. Um, and I don't know how to talk probabilistically about how likely I am on the good born rule branches and not the other ones because I can't use the centered born rule if the centered born rule is only part of the best analysis of my own branch. You just said that other branches don't have the centered born rule. So how can I make statements that overlap from branches that have the centered born rule and those that don't by using the centered born rule? This is where I'm I'm confused. So yeah. So first, let me switch the example. So you know, if the universe is sufficiently big, there's going to be within epsilon a near exact physical duplicate of you and us and all this. You know, way out there. The analog of your question would then be, why am I here rather than out there? And I'm saying that's a good question, but I don't see that this is a challenge for my view. It's not a challenge to contemporary cosmology <laughs> that there's a question about why you're here rather than over there. It's just a kind of, I think that the, the it has the character of like understanding um, the logic of indexicals and what counts as a good answer to an indexical question. What I would just say in follow-up to that is, 
personally, I don't think we have a good probabilistic way to talk about huge universes with lots. I mean, I, I would say that's exactly a case in which I don't know how to do probability. And as you know, there's a wide ranging debate over how to talk about indexable probabilities in very large universes with many copies of us. There is no resolution to this. There's no consensus on how to proceed. I see this proposal as in some ways being potentially a victim to those same mysteries. I, I, yeah, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm not seeing the mystery because I'm thinking there's a very easy way to talk about probability. Use the center born rule. The center born rule is going to tell you the chances of certain things on those other branches. Now, all those chance facts are relativized to your branch. And, you know, they have a centered rule that will be telling them the chances of stuff on your branch and the, and the stuff that would happen on our branch, but, and all those facts are relativized to their branch. So there's no, there's no conflict because we've got, you know, this kind of, it, it, there's no conflict because it's a relation basically uh, between a branch and a chance fact. Um, so yeah, what, like what's the, the I mean, we will all have different judgments about what's going to happen to us. That's true, but that's a good thing because different things will happen to us. Yeah, I'm still a little unclear, but but let's move on. Um, Lev, you have the next question. Hey, Lev. Uh, hello, Isaac. And I'm really sorry that you haven't been in Tel Aviv because this this is this is this was the right time to discuss this issue. Uh, in Tel Aviv, um, I said that to understand many words, one has to accept that you cannot ask questions, what will happen to you? And the reaction was, forget about this. No one will uh, want a theory when you cannot ask this question. And your talk was kind of a, a proof of this. You took it for granted. From my point of view, what you are telling makes no sense. You cannot ask what will happen to you because many words tell you that all will happen to you. Just to get probability, you said this, uh, Susie, it's T2, whatever, uh, ask about probability of being on the left side. So uh, to get about probability, it should be all right or wrong. And if you don't have anything to say it's right or wrong, then it makes no sense. And in, in, in many words, the standard many words, not like many minds of Barry, uh, Barry and Dave, you don't have um, worms. You started with worms kind of without uh, talking about this, but if there are no real ontological worms, you cannot talk about this because you, Isaac, will be, uh, you will die in different ways. Isaac, which will die in particular place, you can discuss but if, if you'll go to all of them, there's no meaning for this. Your analogy is roads. If you have a road which has uh, later, it will be two different roads. And before it was maybe two different roads. So it, it has one road. There is no meaning. It will go to both. There is no anything that is go one or another one. But there is one thing which I'm with you. The last thing you said that there is this orthodox thinking, uh, uh, thinking about the centered uh, properties. Uh, you cannot ask what will happen to you in normal situation. But if you'll take, will make my trick with sleeping pill, and then you will be in a situation when you are branched. And you know, uh, this is not that, uh, uh, you know, and you, the only thing you don't know in which branch you, you are, because the uh, situation is identical. Then it's centered proposition, which is additional to the uncentered physics, which we have, is to have a born rule, a probability of my self location. But you know, in no way you can put it to future unless you introduce physical worms. And I understand you don't want it, or maybe you do want it, but without introducing physical worms, you cannot ask what will happen to you. You only can uh, ask, uh, about self-location under you already branched. Yeah. So, okay. Two things. So one is I do, I definitely want these worms to exist. And that is an important part of the view. Uh, the second is all, all these things you're saying about what can and cannot be asked are just empirically false. 
So I don't know how to respond. What do you mean empirical I mean, this they contradict should, empirical this should be a matter if I, if I bet on something, it should be truth or false value. And here there is no, that you, unless you have this additional physical uh, hidden variable, mind or whatever, there is no, uh, you cannot say what is true if, you will, if, if it will be all on the left or not. And you can, there is no, it's T, T0, bring super over, bring now super technology, God, all gods together, which will tell you in which branch will, will you be. Uh, you, you say that they're physically identical and something, what, what does it mean physically identical? Because you say it's not identical because you, it's a worm. But there is no, but the question, it's not, if, if you consider a worm and you know, the worm knows where it will end up. So it's not the question. The question, it's you now where you will end. And if there is no any physical element, any ontology, which will tell, because the, and the many words, ontology is that you by, by fiat will go to all of them. This is the whole point of many words. No, so throughout that question, you just keep conflating. You use it sometimes, which is an indexical, and then you use a name sometimes, which is not. And so I just can't. I, there's so many oh, mistakes you. switching back and forth between indexical and non-indexical ways of trying to make a point. So that that's why I don't even know. What to say to you. I don't. But I was saying when I was saying you were you were empirically wrong. There's this empirical science, linguistics, that posits a very important distinction. It does ascribe meaning to all of the sentences that you were saying are meaningless. So you're empirically wrong. I mean, it's a question possibly that. So Lev, I understand that in. Uh, you know, the, the many worlds interpretation, you know, the ontology doesn't include there being a hexaity or a soul or a mind or something like I is not an ontological object that is floating around like a hidden variable. And, and on the one I, hand, I think, I think there's agreement, I, agreement between you and, and, and Isaac about that, right? There's no, yeah. yeah. No, that is I, I can talk about I to my past. This is pretty well defined. Unless there is Wigner, which will play with me. But if there is no Wigner, then there is I to my past. And there is a, a good question, why uh, I see born uh, probabilities in my records? I cannot ask questions that I will see born probability because I will see all outcomes. There is no meaning what I will see in the future. It's just, this is what makes no sense. So, Unless so, I will say- yes. Wait, does Lev say, say, say saying he always sees all outcomes of all experiments? No, I will be many of me, so I will not discuss I will be many, so I cannot talk about myself, what I will see. From out of me now will be many me, and then there's the whole discussion. I cannot say what I will see, because there are many different me. It's, so it's a completely different uh, paradigm. I cannot, this is not normal language. I can talk about uh, coherently about my past, because there is only one past. I cannot talk about coherently about my future, because there will be many futures. We are not used to it if we are used to a single word. But if we accept many words, we have to accept that we cannot talk about what will happen to me because there will be many of me out of me. So there is no meaning for this sentence, what will be with me? If there is a meaning, if there is some pointer like Dave point and you say worm, if your worm is sitting and this worm, you, in, the, in your presentation, it was clear that you believe that, uh, that Susie at T2, T0, there is particular uh, uh, Susie one at T0. And there is no Susie one and two zero. So at T zero, at, uh, at T zero, there is soon, there is something which will be all Susies. There is no Susie one. You say physically identical, whatever. If there is no, but you say physically identical, you mean then somewhat not identical. But if you want to discuss in it's T zero Susie, there is no other thing. So you cannot ask what Susie will go to the to the uh, future. And like uh, Jacob said, that uh, if you already said that Susie one, it's the one which will be on the left, then there is no question, it's uh, circular. This question cannot be asked, what, will, well, what is the probability at T0 was it, uh, that I will, as you said from the beginning, if it's already given, then the question, the answer is trivial and not interesting. Susie one will be Susie one. And what, if it's I or Susie, what will happen to you? This question makes no sense because I will be all of them. Your beginning is exact. So then, no, but you, you, 
it's artificial. You put, you define warm and you put and followed from it and it put all kinds of discussion. But the beginning, it doesn't work. You cannot define warm. Yeah, I mean, e even the sentences you are uttering are contradicting themselves because you are using the very name that you are claiming is meaningless to say that the name is meaningless, but it has to be meaningful in order for the sentence that you utter to, to have any meaning. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. We've talked about this before. I just, I think the short way to put it is what you're saying is empirically false because we've got this empirical science of linguistics that assigns but, meanings to all the things that you're saying are meaningful. It doesn't talk about the future. What, what do you mean? The, the, and linguistic and whatever developed with the idea that there is a single word. People are not used to plurality of words. And they do, in any way, we don't, future that, that doesn't exist yet. You cannot tell me that what I'm saying is empirically wrong. Future doesn't exist yet. All that we have is rock records. No, we don't have future. Empir you say I'm empirically wrong. I, I make statement about future. You cannot say I'm wrong. Future didn't happen yet. So, so this is um, this, you cannot attack me on this on this level. Uh, the, the, I think there is a more interesting question about yeah, does the future exist right now or not? And that there's a like tricky metaphysical issue. But just the basic point that you think that state you know terms right now referring to future objects can't be meaningful because the future doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That's also empirically false because, again, our best empirical okay. science of semantics. Block universe is fine with me, then exist. But clearly, what we know now is this is not empirical evidence for us. You'll agree that we don't have, in, when you're not a retrodiction, uh, so uh, we don't have information from the future. I, mean, I can't believe in the blocked universe, but we don't know the future. You just uh, used the definition. Evidence, we should future. know it now. We what, don't what, know did your, what did your definition description refer to? You just used a definite description, the future. What did your definite description refer to? What future? It's not clear what's future. Yeah. You, you, know, used what a, you used two words, Lev. The yeah. followed by future. Those two words form a definite description. Well, the standard what, linguistic what, what, theory of the reference of a definite description take the reference to be some sort of object. What most people would say is it is the object that is the future like everything from here on out. But you're saying there is no such object. So then I'm asking you, okay, no, 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 we can, we can there try is to revise all object. of linguistics. So let's start with no, this. But I cannot ask what, what I, is the meaning what of that? I will history? feel because I will be not men. I will be multiple creature. I will be many men. So when you ask what I will feel in the normal language, it's when a person. And in the future, what will come out of me, not a person, but many persons. So this is why I cannot say what will happen to me. This is the reason. I will be many person. I cannot ask what I will be many person. And when I say what will happen to me, if it, if uh, I will be happy or sad, but there will be many. One of me said one of the uh, one happy. So of course I cannot. That's I cannot say. I mean, this just is to why pick I up another thing. It. You just keep saying you'll be many persons. That's logically inconsistent. So that's false. Well, what do you mean logic? This is what many words tells me. We'll need to put a pause on this conversation, as interesting as it is, because I do want to make sure we have an opportunity for everyone else to ask their questions. If we have time, we can come back to it, because I, I do think there's, I, I even have some follow-ups on this, but I, I want to make sure other people have, have uh, questions as well. So if it's okay with both of you, may I, may I move on? Yeah, thank you, Lev. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, Ioana, you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about... Um, um, empirical predictions in your view. So you suggested that um, centered prepositions uh, can uh, explain something that cannot be explained by uncertain prepositions. Uh, so uh, the former have uh, some explanatory power that the latter lack. And I was wondering whether you would uh, say the same about predictive power. Are there any empirical predictions that, uh, in your view, that can be made based on centered proposition, but cannot be made based on uncentered propositions? Good, thanks. Um, so just really quick, if I, if I said something about explanatory power, I, was pro I spoke too quickly. Um, I'm not, I, there are a bunch of notions of explanatory power and I could see some of them being better or worse than others uh uh but anyway um uh 
you know, sometimes center proposition might be more explanatory powerful for one purpose and uncentered propositions are more explanatory powerful for another. But just to your thing about prediction. So yeah, here, here's how to think about it. So you, first, what you do is you get completely clear on the reference for all your names and definite descriptions. That's why I had the four names, Susie 1, Susie 2, Susie 3, Susie 4. And I was completely clear about what object that refers to. It refers to this temporal, you know, Susie 1, that, that word refers to this temporally extended thing that exists in this specific branch. Um, so what is the chance that Susie 1 exists in that branch? Zero or one. It's, that sort of follows just automatically from the definition of the term plus the Schrodinger equation, basically. Uh, now, um, so this is going to link up to prediction in the following sense. There will be there will be propositions that don't obtain with you know probability zero or one. So the proposition I am on the leftmost branch. Uh, how often will that? Uh, that the, what, with what frequency will that? With with what frequency will that? Excuse me, centered proposition obtain? Uh, it's going to turn out uh, roughly the frequency that the Born rule predicts. It's going to obtain you know one half of the time or what, whatever the coefficient squared is going to be. Um, so that's the kind of predictive power of centered propositions, I think, if I was understanding your question correctly. Uh, the, the centered propositions are the things that don't just automatically follow from, you know, clearly defining the reference for your terms plus the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the centered things are where the indeterminism lies. And so all the usual pre quantum mechanical predictions, they're all going to concern those, those centered propositions, basically. Does, th did that make contact with what you were thinking? Uh, yeah, so uh, just quickly, would you agree that if we had only uncentered, uncentered propositions, then we wouldn't have all the empirical content of the theory? That's interesting. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, so right. One of the, here's a way to spin it. One of the lessons of quantum mechanics um is that the distinction is really empirically important the distinction between centered and uncentered propositions uh because you have determinism over some class of propositions and indeterminism over another um and the the set of propositions you have determinism over are the uncentered ones so you know the reason i don't quite want to put it the way you put it you said something like if there were no centered propositions is a proposition for my purposes here is just whatever you think a meaning of a certain sort of sentence is. So it would be something like saying that, you know, imagining a situation where there were no central propositions is like imagining a situation where it's impossible for there to exist any indexicals. Um, like, and and that's that just isn't the case because I mean, as our actual world demonstrates, we use indexicals. They they are these are really existing linguistic items. So so Imagining a situation where there are no centered propositions is kind of like imagining a situation where there's there's no logical conjunction operator or where that's impossible for that operator to exist. And it's hard to imagine that. But I would so I just want to twist what you said slightly and, and put it in terms of like, what is the extra over and above? Like, what contribution do the center propositions make to the view here? Like, what are they adding? And what they're adding is they 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 form an algebra over which there can be a certain amount of indeterminism of the sort that the Born rule describes. The uncentered propositions form an algebra that's where, where the like, you know, relevant relations are purely deterministic. And it's because Schrodinger evolution is deterministic. So once you've once you've clearly specified, you know, by Susie one, I mean this chunk of branch one, by Susie three, I mean this chunk of branch three. Like once once all those meanings have been laid down. There's, it's just going to follow automatically that, of course, Susie 1 has to be on the leftmost branch and Susie 3 has to be on the middle right one. But what won't follow automatically is, uh, you know, uh, am I on the leftmost branch, even when Susie 1 is the person who's asking that question? That doesn't, that still won't follow automatically. Thank you. Thanks. I had a super quick follow up to that, and this might be a simple question. Um, about centered versus uncentered propositions mm -hmm. and evidence and so forth. Um, so when I use indexicals, even essential indexicals in various statements, even in a even in a question that has an empirical meaning, like for example, I say, 
oh yeah, the probability I'm going to miss the bus is 30%. I can break that up into two pieces. I can break it up into a piece. I am Jacob Barrandes, who lives, yeah, in, let's say where I live, at Earth, whatever. Together with the statement, Jacob Barrandes, who lives wherever, has a probability of 30% of missing the bus. Notice that the probability has been attached to the uncentered statement. The centered statement doesn't have a probabilistic character, at least on this sort of flat-footed understanding. Sure. Um, yeah. To, and, and as far as I can tell, all the scientific, all the empirical experience we have pre-quantum mechanics with with uh, essential indexicals is that they can always be factorized in that way. Uh, I can't, and maybe I'm just not thinking correctly, but I can't think of any other examples except maybe in large universe cases where there's a lot of confusion and maybe we don't live in a large, you know, I don't know, I don't know. But but pre, but other than that, I, I can't think of any examples. And, and, and by the way, even in a large universe, even if there is some way to do the probabilities with essential indexicals, we don't have good empirical data right now that favors one view or the other. So it could be true that we can assign probabilities directly to unfactorizable essential, essential indexical statements. But why do we, do we have any good empirical evidence that that's a safe thing to do? Or is this a leap of faith that we can in fact assign probabilities to essential indexical statements? Because it does seem like that's unavoidable here. Good, good. So, okay, so a couple things. You said assign probabilities. There are two things you could mean by that in my framework. You could mean assign chances. You could mean assign credences. We always assign- I mean chances. chances. Yeah, so you must mean- the, the, I mean the, chances, yes. Good. Because yeah, credences, I'm, I'm a little, I'm always a little nervous about credences and assign to, I mean, for all kinds of reasons. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, so you mean these objective probabilities, these chances. Um, so, right, I was going to say the large universe would be the other case. I mean- when you say what's our empirical evidence, I would just say it's all the empirical evidence for, you know, non-relativistic quantum mechanics supports my view. So we have tons of empirical evidence for doing this. Uh, be, and it's in part because I think other versions of Everett uh, uh, are just not going to work. I think uh, they, they, they require these very extreme normative principles that are just not plausible or like sort of they try to be, another thing they do is they try to be neutral on the metaphysics of people, sort of in a way that I think Lev was gesturing towards. Um, and then they just, they don't, it's just, they end up having to say things that don't make any sense. Like they they say that, you know, the agent here is distinct from the agent up here, even though they're kind of continuous. Uh, but then the agent here's preferences rationally constrain the agent up here. And that's just false. I mean, my preferences don't rationally constrain yours. Uh, unless we're interacting and it's, you know, anyway so so yeah because of all the problems with alternatives to Everett maybe maybe a slightly more modest way to put it would be you know conditional on we want to be Everettians rather than Bohmians or GRW or whatever uh, this is the only way to go and so actually all the empirical support for just quantum mechanics is going to be empirical support for my theory you'll have to be a little bit careful when you are talking about the propositions that experiments are testing because on my view there's a lot of slippage that ha and it's happened a few times in these conversations where you think you're talking about an uncentered thing but really you're talking about a centered thing um and now like, i only refer to myself in the third person that's it yeah, yeah right. <laughs> i'm only <laughs> but 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 let me just let me just quickly say i want to make sure we get to other people i just want I, what i was going to say is there seems to be a little bit of an only game in town kind of argument here which is quantum mechanics works really well and none of the other interpretations seem to do a good job. So that's evidence for this particular view, but that makes me very nervous. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, and I don't actually have that only game in town view. I think there are virtues of the rationality accounts. I think there's like a balancing act that's going on. I personally actually prefer Bohm for non-relativistic quantum mechanics because you don't have to do this. You don't have to do any of this. You just have to have a super simple uncentered extra equation and you have to be a little bit more serious and like an adult about your metaphysics basically uh but then i think everett is better for relativistic stuff so because we don't have a bump so okay that that's a kind of only game in town argument but yeah i'm sympathetic to your to your concern yeah. thank you very much that was very helpful uh barry uh, please go ahead hey thanks isaac that was fantastic um you can't see me because my camera's broken sorry Oh. Um, so it must be like, are you in Singapore? 
Uh, no, I'm in, I'm at my parents' house in Indiana right now. Oh, I'm going to be in New good. York in a couple of days. I'll email you. Oh, good. I was feeling bad for you because it was like three in the morning. And so <laughs> don't feel bad. Okay, so I have a question that's re related to many of the other questions that came. Uh, but first, I wanted to say, just related to the last bit of discussion with Jacob, that um, uh, if you're going to make sense of Everett, I do think the way you're going is an improvement over what L Lev referred to the Many Minds account. It's kind of like the Many Minds account in which you get rid of the ontology and you put it all into linguistics. Exactly, yeah. And I think that's very cool. I just wanted to make it clear that when David and I wrote that paper, you know, this many years ago, we meant it as a way of making fun of Everett, not as a, an alternative real proposal. <laughs> and maybe at the end, that's what I'm going to think about what you're doing. I'm not really <laughs> sure. But here's my question related to what Jacob was talking about earlier. Um, suppose that I'm on a, I'm, here I am, Barry, and I ask this question, how likely is it that I will observe the Born Rule, frequencies that conform to the Born Rule? I just, from all the discussion that went on, and maybe I was, wasn't paying attention, because I was watching the World Cup. So <laughs> don't don't say don't please don't say the score. Baby. <laughs> okay, but again. I I I just don't understand your answer to that question. If okay. you know, I'm I'm many Barrys. I sometimes think that independently of quantum mechanics. But here I am, and if if I'm Barry on one of those branches that's going to see the 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 Born rule, well, the probability is one. If I'm some on some other branch. I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, if I'm Barry 19 and my Barry 19 doesn't see the branch rule, it's probably zero. So, so how, are you, how are you answering that question? How likely is it that I will see the Born rule? Yeah. So I'm going to say, no, you're not many berries. So first of all, you're exactly one berry. So you and all the berries are physical duplicates right now. And you all say the sentence, I am Barry 19. Okay. And I'm responsible for all the awful things that they've done. No, you're not responsible. You're only <laughs> responsible for the berry that you are, Barry. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 I, I will stop kidding around. Okay. Okay. So I'm just Barry. So how likely is it that I will see the born rule? How likely is it that? Oh, I see. So it's like a it's a likelihood question about. That's a kind of a weird. It's kind of like saying. I mean. I can ask how likely is it, as Jacob was saying, how likely is it that I will catch the bus? Well, it, what's weird is that you're asking how likely is it that a physical law will obtain, and I I think that's a that's a weird that's a weird. I'm not question. asking. No, I'm not asking that question. How what likely is it that I will see frequencies that that conform to the Born rule? So let's let's just pick a let's make it a claim about a particular rather than a generalization a sort of problem. So you, how likely is it the, the z spin up electron will come out x spin up? Let's say that. I How say likely you, is that I, I want to know about the frequency. I want to I want to know about the long term frequencies that I will. Oh, the long, okay. So some, you know, how likely is it that over the next ten thousand in my in my lifetime or in the lifetime sure, sure, sure. of uh, yeah. my ancestors? Uh, another question I had actually, but I won't go into that. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. So you plug you plug it into the centered born rule, and it says almost one. Okay, but but what came up earlier is what we we wonder about. Uh, that may be might be tried, might not be right, but we'd like it to be the case, as people bring it up earlier, that it has some sort of a, I don't know, a, a, an explanation in terms of the laws about why that's so. But this just seems to be just a feature of the fact that it's a, and, and it might not even be right, I don't know, but a feature that I'm on a particular branch. Yeah, this was my point from before, exactly, Barry, that was, that was what I was asking. Yes, okay. I, I I was trying to re-say what you were saying, and I don't know if I did any improved on it or not. Yeah, it, it is a feature of your branch. That's true. And and according to the law on your branch, the, the chance of that, you know, feature obtaining on your branch is almost one. Yeah. But what's the problem? But I will, I, I, maybe if I could put a quick finger on this. Yeah. So yeah. there is something very special about the Born rule. Right. So if you if you imagine, okay, let's let's fix the Schrodinger equation. Let's fix the universal wave function. All these things that we're just gonna we're just gonna fix. Yeah. 
the branches, there'll be branches that don't have that that don't have the centered born rule. They have the centered Schmorn rule with a Good. cubic yeah. or whatever. Yeah. There'll be zillions mm -hmm. of various kinds. Good. And no the rule born rule, rule is definitely the nicest of all those possibilities. That's true. It is absolutely the nicest. You know, it's the one that pops out of probability conservation in Bomi mechanics. It's the one that the squared norm has all kinds of magical features. Yeah. Yeah. It seems extraordinary that the branch I am on happens to be a branch in which this most perfect of all of the probability laws is the one that in fact holds, given that I could have been on all the other branches and or the, that, that, you know, that the other, that the branches exist that have all these crazy rules that are wrong. Why should I have been so incredibly lucky to be born uh, on, on this, to be, be living this, it, to me, this, Good. given yeah. that those branches are definitely there, Right, so, so in, in 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 a in a Humean account, a best systems account uh, with one world, well, there's just one world. But in this case, there are zillions that have all kinds of bizarre other rules. It seems remarkable that I should be on one in which the rule is the best of the rules. Doesn't that seem unlikely? When you when you say remark, you are implicitly appealing to a probability measure over the worlds that, on my view, is illegitimate. The only legitimate probability measures are the ones that you get from some physical theory or something like that. There's no like a priori way to count across. I agree. The I agree. I can't be it's precise kind of about it, but it just on, it just on... shocks my conscience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I, mean, so first of all, I agree. It shocks my conscience as well. Uh <laughs> second of all, though, I think when you when you see what I just said, so you see, oh, I'm implicitly appealing mistakenly to a to a like uniform measure over people or something. And I can't do that. What 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 probability measure should I be using? The the one that's physically justified. What's that? That's the center born rule. And how likely is it that I would see what I'm going to see according to that rule? Oh, it's near one. So actually, I shouldn't be. I... <laughs> it it kind of reminds me of the when, whenever you ask, you know, so when you ask Sean Carroll questions about yeah. like circularity, he says it's not circularity. It's just wonderful self consistency. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel in this case a little circular to me. That's it. Interesting. Yeah. Can I just put a, a finger just on your sentence. finger on my question? And that, that was earlier in your talk, you made reference to typicality. And yeah. I think that's what's in the back of one's mind here. One's thinking, well, you know, born rule frequencies are typical. But of course, that's question begging. That's where the circularity right. is. Right. Right. And I think that that typicality measure is the right way to count how many possibilities there are. And it's going to say they're all lumped on the, you know, the density is really high on the born rule branches. Why? Uh, why should we count like that? Because that's what the experiments, uh, can, uh, just the unusual empirical reasons. Experiments suggest that as the right measure. It's experiments in our world. Yeah. Great. The, no, all all experiments ever are experiments in our world. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with that, of course. <laughs> we're, we're trying to bring out the, what strikes many people here as circular. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm, I don't think it's been brought out uh, yet. But may just again. Normally, when you when you when you point out something circular in someone's reasoning, they go in circles and they're never convinced that they're in circles. <laughs> That's true. Fair enough. <laughs> but I'm going to sum this up. Yeah, Lev, you want a quick finger, but I also want to make sure Carl gets a chance to ask a question. He's been waiting patiently the whole the whole time. But just a finger, just one sentence. I want to say again: all these questions are meaningless <laughs> because even if I assume a super technology, super god which can, can create a zillions of universes like this and un, you know, zillions of Isaacs. There is no meaning that it will say born or not born. Or. There's no experiment, Duncan experiment, which will answer this question. So you cannot ask what is the probability for something for which there is no uh, even Duncan experiment. It's meaningless question. You can, you know, it's not a circular answer or whatever. The question itself, meaningless. Yeah, I, I understand you have that view. You're just empirically wrong. I want to make sure Carl has a chance to ask a question. We have a few minutes left. Carl, thank you for being patient. Thank you so much. Please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, I enjoyed the talk also, Isaac. Thanks. But um, uh, my, my question is actually related to the, the things we were talking about um, with Barry's question. I don't see why, um, if, if we're applying the Humean best system framework and looking at frequencies and looking at laws that summarize the frequencies, why it doesn't turn out that in most branches, 
the, the probability rule is what Peter Lewis called the branch counting uh, rule instead of the Born rule. And in fact, just as long as you're keeping to this idealization of discrete uh, branching, um, it seems to me that it's got to be uh, the branch counting is the best system rule about probability in almost all um, uh, branches. And that's not what you want. And then it turns out that the branches in which even just the past uh, looks like the Born rule are incredibly atypical in, in the entire multiverse. Yeah, good. So I'm going to, I'm, I'll say something related to what I was saying before, maybe different though. So the justification, every time you want to make a claim about how likely or most or anything that uses implicitly a measure, I'm going to ask, what's your justification for that claim? And I'm going to say the best justification for any such claim is going to be a bunch of empirical frequency facts. So this is part of why I'm not seeing the circularity yet, because the explanation just goes from empirical frequency facts to the general claim uh, that invokes a measure. And so the empirical frequency facts support the typicality measure, basically that Everett himself used in his papers. It's, uh, you know, it says that the vast majority, uh, the, the right way to count worlds is such that the vast majority are going to be psi squared, you know, born rule obeying uh, branches. Now that's I'm different. Sorry, from... I, I, I don't understand this, uh, this thing about how to count worlds. I mean, the, the worlds, the branches are discrete. There's just the ones that there are. And so I, I totally understand if what you're saying is that apply, you know, applying the normal scientific procedures and looking at our past, we, we come to the conclusion that the Born rule gives us the, the human best system. And then uh, we make predictions according to that. But I'm just saying that in the, you know, take, take the, your example with the Susies and ramify it and it's basically like the the situation where you have um looking at all the possibilities for flipping a coin a thousand times just look at all of the possible sets of 1000 outcomes for coin flips it's just a, a combinatorial fact that in almost all of them you, you find a 50 50 frequency and that's true whether the coin is biased 90 percent heads or not so what i'm my objection yeah. is that you're on this uh, Everett, Everett plus the theory you're proposing in almost all worlds, um, the, the human best system is not what we see in our world. The human, human best system is what Peter Lewis would tell you, which is the branch counting um, version of the, of the probability rule. Good. So, okay. Isaac, you can have a response to this, but then we have to, we have to close. Okay, so. yeah, this will be my, my last comment. So yeah, two things. So that's good. Thanks, Carl. So one thing is maybe it's just the idealization is confusing things. I do, you do have to do all this in terms of densities. And then, you know, cause there's a continuous infinity of these worlds. They're all going to bunch on the born rule ones. Um, so that will eliminate the combinatorial based intuition that you have. So that's, that's one quick response. Here's a more interesting and I think uh, contentious, but I think deep response. I actually don't even think that the proper way to count you know, the number of coin flips uh, is suppose you're flipping a coin a thousand times. I actually don't think there's some a priori fact of the form, the number of such sequences is two to the 1000. I actually think, I think that thinking that is kind of like thinking as a purely a priori matter of fact, space and time has to be flat. I think that you could revise your conception of counting, even for the finite case on the basis of empirical experiments. So take imagine the space of all the measures over the two to the one, you know all the sequences of coin flips that we're talking about. You know some will be atomistic measures. You know the set gets measure one if it contains that sequence and zero otherwise. Then there will be one that's the counting one. There will be one that like biases some collection like uh, in a certain way. I think so. This is the super contentious, very empiricist way of thinking about mathematics. I actually think what, there isn't an automatically correct fact. By automatically correct, I mean something like a priori, like guarantee, like you know, fact about which of those is the empirically right way to count those sequences. In kind of the same way that I don't think there's any a priori fact about what the structure of space or time has to be Euclidean or something like that. Uh, I think you could. I could imagine. Well, you might say to me, Isaac, you can't imagine it, but <laughs> I could hypothesize. In the same way that you could hypothesize that like space time could be curved, I could, and you could say that to Kant, I could hypothesize a sort of way of counting 
uh, that I would formalize using a particular sort of mathematical measure that actually wouldn't be the discrete one uh, that's kind of you know uh, uniform on each e each individual thing. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, but that's obviously super implausible. Um, and I, I just think it's a really interesting, it, I think there's an interesting parallel here to the, the geometry case where, you know, we just have the most, you know, foundational intuitions in the world about combinatorics and counting, just like we have the most foundational intuitions in the world about Euclidean geometries. But I think the empirical world could ultimately push us away from those, those methods of counting. We're going to have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you again, Isaac. That was a really wonderful talk and it was a fantastic discussion Q&A. Thanks for everybody for staying and for participating in this talk and for giving us your, your valuable time. Uh, we'll be meeting again in two weeks. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Eddie Chen, who will be talking about laws. It's going to be very interesting. So stay tuned for an email about that. And thanks again to Isaac and to all of you. Be well, be safe, be healthy until thanks we meet everyone. again. Thanks everyone. I really appreciated the questions and thank you again, Jacob, for inviting me. Of course. Pleasure. All right. Good to see everybody.